Our story today takes us back to the days of the original Game Boy, Nintendo's first cartridge-based portable video game system, the juggernaut that overwhelmed America from the late 80s throughout the entirety of the 90s, even into the 2000s. This little system set in stone Nintendo's legacy as a creator of brilliant hardware and a developer of amazing worlds. The story of the Game Boy begins sometime in 1985 with a Nintendo employee by the name of Gunpei Yukoi. At this point, he has already invented the Game & Watch series of handhelds, Metroid, among many other things, and is very well known at the company. At this point, the Nintendo Famicom had already been out for two years in Japan, but had not yet seen a global release. It was at this time that Gunpei showed a prototype of the Game Boy to Hiroshi Yamauchi, who was the president of Nintendo at the time. His prototype Game Boy was a mixture of his successful Game & Watch and the Nintendo Famicom using Gunpei's brilliant design philosophy, lateral thinking of withered technology. Creating a portable video and game system capable of playing games via flash cartridge, using old and cheap hardware that was already well understood in the industry, leading to cheap production cost, long battery life, and easy game development. Yamauchi was impressed with the idea, stating he believed the invention could sell 25 million units over the span of three years. The Game Boy consisted of a custom, sharp, 8-bit 4.19 megahertz processor. It only had one kilobyte of RAM and one kilobyte of video RAM. A reflective LCD that was 160 by 144 pixel that was capable of showing four shades of quote gray, which was actually four shades of green thanks to that super budget nature of the screen. It could have 40 sprites on screen. It supported up to four player multiplayer via the link cables and it ran off four AA batteries that provided an extremely impressive up to 40 hours of gameplay with high quality batteries. Over here in the United States, the president of Nintendo of America, Minoru Arakawa, said that he could push a hundred million units. Right from the very start, it seemed everyone in Nintendo knew what was it was going to be a huge hit. Arakawa knew that it would need a hit game to push that many units. Not only that, but a hit game that had not yet seen any type of portable version available. Nintendo had seen the explosion in popularity of the game Tetris and decided this was the perfect candidate to help launch the Game Boy in the hand of kids and parents alike across the globe. Mere months before the Game Boy was ready to launch, Nintendo was able to strike a deal with the creators of Tetris and lock it in as the pack-in title for the Game Boy. Little did they know that Tetris would not be the only third-party game to completely explode the popularity of the console. It would be a completely new franchise that would take the entire world by storm. A whole new series of games that would keep the Game Boy relevant for years and years to come after its release. A series that completely captured the minds and imaginations of an entire generation of kids. Maybe multiple generations of kids. Pokemon. The Game Boy would release in 1989 in Japan and in the United States, and in 1990 in other markets in the world. It launched at $89.99, with Tetris included in the box, with batteries included in the box, and would also have five launch titles in the United States. Alleyway, Baseball, Tennis, Tetris, and Super Mario Land, with many more to come very shortly after. It was an immediate success, selling 40,000 units in the first 24 hours. The Game Boy had its share of competition, though none of them came close to the popularity of the Game Boy, even though they had many improvements. Atari would be set to release the Lynx also in 1989. This would be the first portable console to market with a color backlit screen, which at the time was amazing in comparison to the Game Boy. 
it would be a landscape design being more comfortable in the hand making for easier longer play sessions it could also show more colors on screen more sprites and had much faster processors and more ram but this made it a very expensive console launching at 179 which in today's money is nearly four hundred dollars the Lynx would see one console revision in 1991 by the name of the Lynx 2. It would make several significant improvements to the original model. It offered stereo sound through the headphone jack, a better, clearer black backlit screen, longer battery life, the ability to turn off the backlight to conserve even more power, and had a complete physical overhaul and offered much more attractive design compared to the original. It also released at 99, which is much more compelling than 179. But it was too little too late. The Lynx never really got any big smash hit games, and quickly got overshadowed once the Sega Game Gear hit its release. Once the Sega Game Gear hit the scene, that was the final nail in the coffin for the Atari Lynx. Sega released the Game Gear in 1991 in the US, and it also had a full color backlit screen which was extremely impressive, just like the Lynx was, but it also supported playing Sega Master System games natively via an adapter, which only added to its raw technical ability and its games library. The Game Gear was Nintendo's biggest competition even though it was still far behind in sales. The Game Gear was also much more powerful. It supported more colors, more sprites, more everything, just like the Lynx in terms of visuals. But it just never caught up to the popularity of the Game Boy. Although, it also com completely dominated the Atari Lynx. Its biggest drawbacks were its comparatively horrendous battery life at 5 hours off of 6 AA's, whereas the Game Boy could give you up to 40 off of 4 AA's and its higher price, it launched at $149.99, which in today's money would be nearly $300. Yet it was still less expensive than the Lynx, until the Lynx 2 released shortly after the Game Gear did, which caused Sega to cut the price of the Game Gear quite early on to try to compete with the Lynx and the Game Boy. Those things in combination with never seeing a hardware revision over the Game Gear's entire lifespan led the Game Gear to be quite success successful, but never reaching the popularity of the Game Boy. The Game Gear had a long lifespan, lasting until the year 2000, before discontinued in some countries. I really wish the Game Gear would have seen a successor, but Sega was so busy trying to juggle so many home consoles in the 90s, but that, that's got to be a subject for its own video. NEC also released a portable console to compete with the original Game Boy, and it's definitely the most impressive of what you could call the first generation handheld systems from a technical standpoint. It was called the Turbo Express, and it was released in 1990, after the Game Boy and after the Lynx, but still a little bit before the Game Gear. It was also a color and backlit system, just like the Lynx and the Game Gear, but it was much more advanced than all three. It was literally a portable TurboGrafx-16, which was absolutely insane to see at the time. I mean, like, imagine seeing Microsoft release the Xbox One as a portable to compete with the 3DS and the PS Vita. That's kind of like what this was back then. Expensive and unbelievable. It used the same cartridges as the TurboGrafx-16 and also supported multiplayer. But all that tech came at a cost, a very high cost. It would release at 249 in the US in 1990, which is basically 500 bucks in today's money. It would never really compete seriously with the other handhelds, but it did go on to sell over a million units in its relatively short four-year lifespan before being discontinued in 1994. 
The Game Boy would see a second wave of popularity in the mid-90s with the release of the Pokemon series of games. Pokemon Red and Pokemon Blue would release in 1996 to the Game Boy seven years into its lifespan, boosting its sales again. The Game Boy would see countless amazing titles that completely set it apart from the competition. I mean, like the awesome Super Mario Land 2 Six Golden Coins, The Legend of Zelda Link's Awakening, a cult classic with an awesome new revival on the Nintendo Switch, Super Mario Land 3 Wario Land, I mean the Pokemon series, Kirby's Dream Land. It, in combination with the Game Boy Color, sold over 118 million units, even passing Arakawa's initial very generous estimation. It stayed in production long enough to see the release of the Game Boy Pocket, the Game Boy Color, and the Game Boy Advance. It was a monumental success for Nintendo, for its inventor Gunpei Yukoi, and it still remains a household name to this day, many years after any Game Boy model has even been on the market. It truly was lateral thinking of withered technology. I mean, now in the days of endless free mobile games with in-app purchases and little to no storyline with little to no imagination, I find myself reaching for that Game Boy more than ever to recapture my childhood and to exercise my imagination, yearning for a renaissance of mobile gaming. Thank you for joining me on this journey back to the past to take a look at the history of the Game Boy, its competition, and its impact on multiple generations of gamers. Share some of your memories with the Game Boy in the comments below. And check out my video on The Ultimate Game Boy Advance. I think if you thought this was interesting, you'd probably like that a lot too. And thanks for tuning in.